and I had the honor of supporting um, the most reverend Professor G. Gobinke honor for the keynote speech of the day. Don't be scared. Catholic. Is it working? Is it working? Is it working? It's okay. I say Catholic priests are not known to be Bible carrying priests. So if you see me come to the podium with a Bible, don't be scared. Good afternoon, everybody. And if I'm pleased to greet. Lady Veronica Tabansi, the wife of the late legendary Ikem D I T. I think he was being called. I, first of all, I want to say how pleased I am that I eventually made it to this occasion. My people say, <laughs> Very often we cut more than we can chew. And I tried to wriggle out of this event, but it was not possible, and I'm happy it wasn't. I'm coming directly from the burial of the father of one of my priests. So that explains why it was even difficult to say exactly when I would be here. I'm happy to be part of this event, celebrating and honoring a great man, but also providing inspiration and encouragement for all of us who would want to do the right thing while we can. I understand that this is the second memorial lecture and the theme you have chosen for this year's lecture or memorial is about avoiding conflicts. If I can have a, a text. Mitigating the effects of interprofessional rivalry through effective health care policy and implementation, a multidisciplinary approach. And I picked up just a short while ago that the late DIT advising all those in the field some years ago said, I know you are now diversifying, but please, all of you have to see yourselves as medical or chemical lab scientists. Medical lab scientists. In spite of the diversification, see yourselves all as med lab scientists. And to that I would add, not just as med lab scientists, but as providers of health care. And that is why I bring the Bible, because I know you looked for me, because I'm a priest and a teacher. I come to you as a priest and as a scholar. I have been a priest for 39 years. Yes, appearance is deceptive. Some think I'm a young bishop, I am not. <laughs> I've been a priest for 39 years and I'm an emeritus professor of philosophy. My area of specialization is the philosophy of human nature, philosophical anthropology. And I was engaged in research and teaching in that field for 25 years, 
in Rome before I came home. But, of course, you know that my priesthood takes precedence over my scholarly engagements. My scholarship helps me in my priestly ministry. That is why the first thing I will present to you is from the word of God, from the letter of St. Paul, first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians that you are very familiar with. Chapter 12, from verses 12, from verse 12 to verse 26. It says, as a body in one, as a body is one, well, if you see me reading some words in a wrong way, know that I'm coming from a difficult engagement, so I don't know if it's clear. <laughs> as a body is one, though it has many parts, and all parts of the body, though many are one body, so also Christ. Now the body is not a single part, but many. If a foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it does not for this reason belong any less to the body. Or if an ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it does not for this reason belong any less to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God placed the parts, each one of them, in the body as he intended. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor again the head to the feet, I do not need you. Indeed, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are all the more necessary. And those parts of the body that we consider less honorable are surrounded with greater honor. And our less presentable parts are treated with greater propriety. Whereas our more presentable parts do not need this. But God has so constructed the body as to give greater honor to a part than that is without it, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same concern for one another. And he concludes, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts share its glory. And this is where I end this reading from the scripture. Remember that the person who was speak, writing this letter was an apostle. And I stand here also as a successor of the apostles. He was an expert in the ways of God. But he found, that, found it helpful to use lessons from a discipline where you are experts to make his point about our relationship with God and with one another. You definitely know more biology, more physiology than St. Paul did. And if we could have this reflection on the unity of the body irrespective of the diversity of its part, from the background of somebody who didn't study biology or physiology, you who are experts in these should even have deeper reflections. Paul ends 
with saying that if one part suffers, the whole body suffers. But my own little understanding or study of biology only to the GCE level teaches me that the operation of our organisms as different from the operation of non-organic beings is such that if there is a wound in any part of the organism, the rest of the organism will strive to heal that little wound. Otherwise, that little wound will eventually lead to the death of the entire organism. And that is how important this imagery of the body that Paul uses is. For any, now, this is the word, organization. We call it organization. And if you call a conglomeration of interests or persons an organization, an organization, you presuppose that that type, that type of arrangement functions like an organism. And if it functions like an organism, it means then that whatever happens to one part is either faced collectively as a challenge by all the parts or that misfortune will eventually lead to the total disintegration in integration of that organization. The Association of Medical Laboratory Scientists of Nigeria seems to have perceived, I'm not an insider, that diversification, specialization, rather than lead to complementarity and the collaboration may be leading to rivalry and destructive competition. Not just for the medical lab scientists, but all the providers of health. I'll tell you a story. My cook is my cousin. Well, the reason is, after graduating, she found no job. Even as a bishop, I couldn't find her a job. For those who think that once you're a bishop, once you pick up the phone, the door opens. You know they work like that, too. <laughs> my cook is my cousin. And her little daughter got sick. And I thought it was a joke. The first day passed. The second day passed. They said, they, I said, have you been to the hospital? Yes, father. What did the doctor say? He gave us some medication and prescribed some tests. Have you done the tests? No. Why? The lab wasn't ready. Then I sent them back to the lab, insist that the test be done. The lab in the same hospital. After the third day, I asked, what was the result of the test? Or rather, what did the doctor say? And the answer, the doctor has said nothing in addition to what he said before. Why? There are no lab results yet. And on the fourth day, the little girl had moved from OPD to admission. What does the doctor say? Nothing. Why? The results are not out. I became really afraid. And since it was my own hospital, I used my powers to threaten to sack everybody in that hospital. 
Uh, well, we ran out of reagents. Well, we were doing it manually. Well, in the meantime, the doctor was patiently waiting for results. But because the lab scientists, now you know where I'm coming from, we are not doing their work. I was risking the loss of the life of my daughter, of my granddaughter. Not because the doctor didn't know his work, but because the lab was not functioning. This is also one of the reasons why I'm here today. Because when these stories are told, they look so far away and sound so unreal until it happens to you. I have once been given medication for typhoid when what I was suffering was malaria. Why? The lab said, no, too, no, said I had typhoid. And the doctor believed them. Now, time was when knowledge was so limited that one person could claim to have so much knowledge about so much. But as time has gone on, we have also been privileged to have specializations. And I taught scientific methodology, but for philosophical research, not for physical or medical sciences, in my university in Rome. And I told my students that to be an expert is to be somebody who knows almost everything about almost nothing. In the sense that the area of your specialization, if you are really a specialist, is so tiny that it is almost nothing. But when you come to that almost nothing section, you know almost everything. And so the specialization has made us acquire so much knowledge, but about such a limited dimension of any reality we are dealing with. And here we have the problem. The problem is that truth is one, knowledge is united, and every one of us can possess only a very limited knowledge of the truth. No matter how vast the knowledge we possess about the limited part we are specialists in. Now I come to philosophy. There is something about the human mode of knowing that nobody knows from nowhere. Every knowledge is knowledge based on pre-knowledge. And one of these things that condition our knowing is even the instrument of knowing itself, which is language. Because you don't know anything that cannot be represented in your experience, either by thoughts or by feeling or by touch. And if I mention the concept in a language that you don't know, you cannot claim to know that concept. But, because of this constraint of the hum in the human way of knowing, the human being remains constantly open because every knowledge is from a point of view, from a perspective. And uh, there is a statement that is very popular that every point of view is only a view of a point. Now, there is a proverb of the Akan in Ghana that describes what philosophers call the perspectiveness in human knowledge very well. Perspectiveness in the sense that every knowledge is always from a point of view or from a perspective. The Ghanaians say, the Akan, that nobody 
can encircle the baobab tree in an embrace. The baobab, if I understand, I've not seen one, but it is larger in extension, in expansion, than an Iroko tree. So we may also say in our own dialect, Namadwa Mebiyehu Oji Oma. The Iroko tree cannot be encircled in an embrace. However wide the expanse of your arms may be, you can only cover a part of that tree. But you are left with some option. You may move around the tree until you have gotten around it. But as you move, you are losing some parts. Because once you change position, you also change your view of that perspective. Many of us have seen something that has been circulated online very often. Two persons looking at a figure. One is seeing six, the other is seeing nine. None of us is wrong. If you say what is written here is six, you are right. If I say what is written here is nine, I am right. It's not a contradiction. The only thing is that sometimes you have to change your perspective. But I add that in addition or besides changing perspective, the human being has also a social way of knowing. And the social way of knowing is that we can know from what another person knows. And therefore I tell the Akan that even though not one, no, no single person can em encircle the baobab with an embrace, we can hold one another's hand and we can circle the baobab tree. That is the only option open to us as human beings. And one of this, uh, the authors who have taught me so much in my research, Viktor Frankl, Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychotherapist that I recommend for all of you as, medical, uh, as practitioners in the medical field. Frankl is more popular for his writing, Man's Search for Meaning, but he has more important writings beside that. Frankl says that we are living in an area of generalization, and the generalization is coming from specialists. And, but he adds that the problem is not that our scientists are specializing, but that specialists are generalizing. And he warns that to avoid this overgeneralization by specialists, every scientist besides knowledge needs wisdom. And he describes wisdom as knowledge plus an awareness of the limits of that knowledge. Because once we are aware that our own knowledge is limited, then we are open to being educated and enlightened by others. For it is as long as we think that the little we know, you know, sometimes we say, as far as I know, but you always have to add, as far as I know is not the farthest that can be known. Because sometimes we think that the, that little that we have known is the only thing that can be known about anything at all. Think of people who practiced medicine among us 50 years ago, 60 years ago. You just needed one health officer in the village. And he would, you would come and he would look at you and feel your temperature and prescribe drugs. And usually the same drugs. And we will say it worked. It didn't work. Oh. <laughs> Many people died. Who could have been saved? But he managed to have, to have cured many as well. So, but because there was no other alternative then, we thought it was working. Now we have got to the point that for any ailment, you have so many areas. Once I, lay, I accompany somebody to see an ophthalmologist in room. And after examining him, he said he should see an ophthalmologist that is specialized in the eyelids. Ah, so has it got to that point? <laughs> 
So, what I am saying, the, one, the first part of my greeting to you, because that's what I regard. I'm not taking what I do as keynote. Keynote cannot be coming at the end, almost, of your engagement. What, the first part of my greeting to you is that I'll just underline that where differences or differentiation or specialization does not lead to collaboration and complementarity, it will inevitably lead to rivalry and destructive competition. And there's no place you see it more than in, this, in your field. People are dying because nurses think that the young doctors are ignorant. And doctors think that nurses are useless. The same thing with the labs. Of course, you study for five years, he studies for five years, he comes out doctor and you come out mister. And these things could have leads to psychological warfare and in the meantime human beings are dying. So I think we have all to realize that in the care for the sick person, the doctor, the lab scientist, the lab technician, the nurse, the midwife, the pharmacists, they are all engaged in one assignment, providing health care. That is one part. The second part that I want to, of my greeting to you touches on something that I consider very important, but probably not covered by the theme of your engagement this year. And that is on the effect the effect of science, technology, on our development and the role that religion plays in all that. I can't leave you as a priest without underlining this, this fact. We are living in an age where people are seeking to find a natural explanation for everything. And a lot, really, that we thought were unexplainable have found scientific explanations. But strangely, many people within our context are still satisfied in offering spiritual and religious explanations for things that have scientific explanations. And to make matters worse, Nigerians will catch a virus, will get an infection, that is even more mysterious, will have a road accident, and a priest will come to tell them it was caused by an evil spirit. <laughs> and people believe that. This has become one of the main reasons for the setback we are suffering in our society. I want to tell you as practitioners in the area of healthcare, that is false religion. True religion is liberating. And that is the mission of Christianity, to liberate the human being from the slavery to natural forces and the fear of natural forces. It was that liberation that empowered the white man to go to the moon. I want to tell you or remind you, Greek culture, Roman culture, Egyptian science, Chinese culture, Indian culture and science, they had all existed for thousands of years before Christianity. But it was not until Christianity came to the scene, into the scene, 
that the human being reappropriated and redirected all these cultures to its well-being and service rather than to, its, to his enslavement. You'll be surprised that the Chinese were more scientifically developed than Europeans. The Indians were more scientifically developed than the Europeans. What we call the Arabic numerals, we are Indian numerals introduced into Europe by the Arabic traders. The Europeans had no idea of algebra, of all the calculations that made modern science possible until they encountered the Chinese and the Indians and the Arabs. But because of their Christianity, it was not an accident that the industrial revolution, scientific revolution, and technological revolution took place in Europe because Christianity developed in Europe. And the Chinese, the Japanese, the Indians had to take back what the Europeans had borrowed from them and now domesticate it afresh. What is making China great is no longer Chinese science or technology, but European science and technology. We as Africans, have you thought of the fact that the coronavirus hit the world in China and in a very short time it was everywhere, even though our people did not accept that it was in our place. But within the space of a few months, a solution was found to that problem. But the world does not yet have an answer to the problem caused by mosquito, to malaria. Reason, we are waiting for them to provide an answer for us. You have all been told that palm oil causes an increase in cholesterol based on whose measurements, reagents, observations, the white man, the European, has used himself as a model for all these scientific calculations. Now the challenge before us is to provide answers to our own problems using the knowledge we may have borrowed from others and the liberation that Christianity has given us. And until we do that, there will be no end to the problems we are suffering. I always like to give an example with the rain. If any of you is organizing any event this weekend, you may be tempted to do either of two things, or both. Either to go to rainmakers and give them some money so that it does not rain, or to hire prayer warriors so that they pray so that it does not rain. Or you send your uncle to the rainmakers and you go yourself to the rain warrior or prayer warriors. No, in car walk, or in car walk. Because that science has never been developed by our people. Because it, we have been made to believe it is magic and it is given by the spirits. I say. It is a lie. I'm telling you it is a lie because I know a German company called the Rainmaker that is making billions of dollars from governments in the Arab world to provide greenery in their desert world. And the owner of that company once told me this science was developed by Africans but was never, was discovered by Africans but was never developed because of their spiritualism. And that is where we are now. So I leave this to you as a challenge as scientists, lab scientists to think of how to codify 
document, measure, codify, document, analysis based on our own experience and our own materials that will respond to our specific problems. That would be more important to healthcare in our area than competing with doctors and nurses about who is more important. And with this, I wish you happy get together and God's bless you. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. You know what, what, what to do more than myself. You want to give him more hands? Thank you, and thank you again. You see why we've been waiting for you. Uh, some people told me that, oh, where is, where is he? Um, we want to go, but want to see him. You see why we're waiting for you? So I've seen exactly what, how it would have been if you had gone for other engagements and you leave us here. I don't know. I don't know. Thank you and thank you again for coming in. We enjoyed every bit of you. What you have said will remain in the annal of history. We won't forget that so soon. Thank you. You want to do something again? Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So the chairman of the occasion, Professor Na, uh, sorry, um, Anthony, um, is going to perform. Anthony Mba is going to perform a function, and then um, can we have you come up. My Lord Bishop, our wonderful keynote speaker, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you see, the only thing that is constant in this world is change. I like in my life to be introducing things new. And I must tell you, sometimes even controversial. But as long as they are new, I'm satisfied. Today, I am doing something that is very new. And uh, all you have to do is to clean your eyes and watch me. We are going to plead with my Lord Bishop to please bless it and multiply it as well. <laughs> so. hey. I have been given an, an assignment to Bless the cola. Am I right, sir? You are right, my Lord Bishop. And the bar is not Jada and Oi, but Kweziuku. For the benefit of those who are not Igbo speaking here, if there are, the general belief is that Oji does not understand any other language except Igbo. And I have challenged that thesis, not as a bishop, but as a scholar. And since it is not a homily or interpretation of the Bible, feel free to tell me that I am wrong. I will tell you why I challenge it. Igbo people don't talk to Oji. They use Oji to talk to God. They use orgy for prayers and they address either God or the ancestors. And they use the language they believe their ancestors understand and that God understands. Right? Since Igbo people don't talk to orgy but to God using orgy. I am free to use any language to talk to my God <laughs> using orgy. And I would not have offended the orgy. 
Because in any case, he does not understand any language. But then, one of my greatest intellectual achievements as a scholar has been to write, to think, write, deliver a two and a half hour lecture in Igbo. Abu Mwafu Igbo. Ihe basari Igbo na demuma. Omena ni Igbo na sam. Oga masim ego ji an Igbo. Mana oboro maka na oji ada anu Igbo na oboro ji kan na agwa. Ngoba ya bo ji ni Igbo. Amemezi ebere mago ya ni Igbo nnam kuzirim na ozin ke mutara muta. Can the other way no? Macane mebo jada and we boa. On your bona sweet bone call, madam, Baziani Miriki. A mark of Madonna never got what he finger, but half a how. Abuzana mass we Miriki, Magabuni, Bomi, what are ya? Came Maracos, ya doing your Yoruba keep Gavari or Fonny Bomodan with Finico. A young wine, I don't know. Nanya can egg. For the Namari Kus, no near with a Raji with a Rando. Manonia with a Raji with a Riffin and Yendo. Magana Ndo was so chineke, Wendo. Ebbing Yeran Yendo Tata and Yek and Egg. Oji at the Coron or Tua Nakuzi and Yfe Makanji call no inch or no two and ya. Anye, the Titi Wani, Anye and Dinina Nafumaka, Ruike. I neck and egg in the night, Jagam. Neck and egg kiss it, poker buying ever. Buying at the rum. Manobrog may be the buying in any jack and maybe here. I went a yogan like Kuzira and Yoso, can we quake it does if I may be? Kai dozia nebo. Nan is in on a madam my whip one easy. I dozia nebo, can doors of a case a Bia mota ki isi e dozi obodo. Aya ne dozi ko ebe ni ina e bi ka ndi ibo maka na ebe onye bi ko na awachi. Aya na yoge ki gozi ndi ani ne na agbambo. Ki isi na ka fa na agwo ya. Maka na ginwa. Ji onye obo na ni ma anyi ndo. Ma ni mego ka iketo oke na mamife e ja aro eziboro. E gozi era anyi oje a gozi ogbako anyi. Me ki ha obo na ine me masige. Ka mbo anyi na agba. Borong borai na kunye gamita kari ya kain toranya sita na Kristi onyango ani na fana na wa na monso amen agom kamutar. So I am calling on Professor Tony Mba. He will be the good person that will hand over the award to you know, to the person that deserves it. Yes. My Lord Bishop, I have come for another ceremony. I'm not celebrating mass. <laughs> I have been asked by the organizers of the Association of Medical Laboratory Scientists of Nigeria, Enugu State Branch, to give you this Distinguished Service Award. So my Lord Bishop, Distinguished Service Award on His Lordship Professor Godfrey Igwebike Ona, Catholic Bishop of Nsuka Diocese in recognition of his role as senior advocate for the masses. This day, 9th of June, 2023. Congratulations, my Lord Bishop. Before he leaves us, he has to do something else to do us by way of talking. 
Yes, I am sorry that I came in when you had already stayed so long and I'm leaving while you are still here. And, but I just have to. And before I leave, I want to thank you immensely for the appreciation you have shown. This recognition of my service to the people of God, say the advocate of the masses. Uh, well, I don't know. All you need to know is that my mission, my vocation and mission to preach the word of God. And I have only one request to make of you. As now, not as association, but as those who may have heard some of the things I say. People tell me that they like the fact that I'm speaking truth to power. And when I hear that, I'm disappointed. Because I thought I was speaking truth first to myself and to everybody else. I'm not selective about whom I'm addressing. If you think I'm addressing only those in power, it means you are not listening attentively. Because I'm addressing everybody from myself as a Christian, challenging myself to be a better Christian. So that's the only way I know how to be a messenger of the gospel. I thank Matt for this presence, very edifying presence, and we thank God for the gift health to you. I cannot hear promise you anything but I know I will continue to pray for this organization. I'm not sure I have a functioning lab in my hospital. So if I make you any promise or I give you any donation they may pounce on me. But I think now that you have made this present to me, I will go home and look for whom I can catch and collect something from him and give to you. So, Allow me to take you to the And since morning. I don't know how much I can collect, I cannot announce anything. But I will keep in touch with you to show uh, just my own token of appreciation for the encouragement you have given me in my ministry. And with this, I will ask the Lord to bless all of you. Thank you very much. Allow me to so take you to the So he's asking that I pray, I bless, that I bless you before I leave. But I'm not closing the function. The Lord be with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. May he let his face shine on you. Amen. May he be gracious to you and grant you his peace. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And thank you very much.